welcome to another episode of West African History and Myths. I'm your host, Afrostorian, and we are going to be continuing part two of a look at the Dahomey Kingdom and its Amazons. We last left off with Agaja successfully conquering Weda after the use of sabotage. And now, Agaja has garnered the ire and the attention of the rising Oyo Empire. Chapter 4 Troubles for Agaja For decades, the Dahomey had been paying tribute to the Oyo, a method of payments designed to prevent aggression from the powerful Yoruba Empire. Agaja, during his expansionary phase, had been lax in his payments to Oyo, which the Empire was unhappy with. Agaja did not wish to engage in warfare with the Oyo, and tried to renegotiate the payments plan. But the talks fell through, and Oyo declared war. In 1727, Oyo marshaled its forces to meet Dahomey, and for all of Agaja's triumphs against Ardra, Kadomi, and Wida, his army was not capable of taking on the mass of the Oyo cavalry, despite the access to firearms. The Dahomey army was pushed back, and the Oyo sacked the capital city, burning the libraries and palaces. Agaja retreated with his armies, hiding in the ancient works built by his ancestor Dakoduno. Oyo would return again in 1728, and this time Agaja would not even attempt to fight, choosing a strategy similar to Russia during the Napoleonic invasions, making it untenable for the Oyo to remain in the capital city due to a lack of available food, forcing the army to retreat back to the home territory. Oyo would repeatedly try to catch Agaja off guard. With his army on the run for several years, until 1729, where Oyo feigned a peace agreement and used the opportunity to decimate a large part of the army. One of the main surviving battalions was that of the Mino, and since they had typically been huntresses, the unit did not have as much trouble hiding in the marshlands to avoid the larger Oyo forces. Things would continue to go wrong for Agaja, thanks to the fact that Hufon, the former king of Wida, still lived. With the invasion of Oyo, Holding Agaja's attention for years, the army stationed in Wida had to be pulled back, leaving the city undefended in 1730. King Hufon saw an opportunity and decided to seize it. Hufon, while in exile, sent correspondence to the British and Portuguese forces. In particular, he built up a relationship with the director of the nearby English fort, Charles Testefall. Testefall had been the main manager of the fort, facilitating the shipment of slaves and other goods back to the British crown. He had been in this position for decades, and had built up a good rapport with the people of Weda. Whatever his reasons, he wrote back to the crown, arguing for support for King Hufon, giving him the funds and the materials needed to build up a massive army reputed to have contained 15,000 soldiers. The caveat in the agreement was that Testafall would be recognized by the crown as an independent entity should the invasion fail, as not to harm trade relations if the Dahomey should prove triumphant in the Second Wida Dahomey War. By this time, the fight against the Oyo 
continued to go poorly for Agaja, having to relocate the capital temporarily to Ardra, going further inland to put himself out of the reach of the Oyo, especially their cavalry, which could not advance further inland due to the natural biological barriers deadly to horses known as the Seisei fly. Agaja's spies in Wida informed him of Hufan retaking the city, and whilst in the midst of its plans regarding the Oyo, he formed a battle plan to push back against Hufan at the same time, despite his army being a fraction of its former size. The crux of the decision would lie with the Mino and his citizens. Agaja would march with his forces and the Mino, and have large caravans of children follow, all of them carrying weapons. The children themselves would never see combat, as reported by French sailors who were stationed at the port of Rida, where they saw the invasion take place in 1730. Houffon marched his army outside of the city, intending to crush the smaller army of 3,000, with his 15,000 troops. According to a mix of French, English, and Dahomey accounts, the children, who performed in a role similar to medieval squires, would hang back on the hill, making the army appear to be far larger than it actually was. And because they were coming up the hill, when the fighting began, the children would fire munitions into the air to give off the impression of a much larger force. This appears to have unnerved the Weida forces, thinking that the children, who likely could not be easily seen from the battlefield view as children, were actually reserve forces. Then the cinch of the plan occurred, as the two front lines clashed. The Mino charged out from the rear of the main force, flanking the Weida army from both sides, cutting off large sections of the confused army, who were now unsure as to where the attack was coming from. This confusion caused the much larger army to do more damage to itself than the Dahomey forces were actually causing. This caused a rout of the Weida forces, allowing the Mino to cut down the fleeing soldiers. Both Houffon and Testofol saw this and fled to the local English fort, which was soon surrounded by the Dahomey after the Battle of Wida. The local garrison informed Agaja that they had nothing to do with this, and listed Testofol as an independent agent and after Agaja paid a ransom sum after retaking Wida, the forts handed Testofol over to Agaja, where he was executed. Houffon remained in exile. It was not long before Agaja learned that another returning belligerent had taken a chunk out of his territory. This time, it was the king of Godomi, renouncing Agaja's rule and receiving financial and military support from the Oyo Kingdom. Seeing that he had no way to fully defeat the Oyo, and nor could he possibly focus on maintaining his borders, he made an entreaty to the Portuguese to help settle a peace agreement between the Dahomey and the Oyo Kingdom. The Portuguese peace agreement helped to settle the borders between the Oyo and Dahomey kingdoms, but the Portuguese ruled in favor of the Oyo, making the borders strengthen the Oyo line. Dahomey would still have to pay tribute to Oyo, and the boundary was set at the Ueme River. In order to make this deal stick, Agaja sent his son, Tegbesu, as a diplomatic hostage to Oyo, ensuring that this war would never happen again in this century. Agaja could finally turn his attention 
to consolidating his borders and rebuilding after recovering from the war with the Oyo. In order to ensure that the European powers would remain neutral, he created the position of Yovogan, which was an ambassadorial job, and Mehu, which was similar in function to a prime minister. This allowed Agaja to hand off the duties of administration while he would go on his military campaigns. In addition, Agaja would place increased defenses in Wida as he feared that Houphon was likely to continue trying to retake his old kingdom. Before he would retake Godomi, he would need to go after another small kingdom that had sided with the Oyo within his territory. The Mahi Kingdom had been supplying the Oyo with food and materials and mercenary units, having established an alliance in a bid to get independence from Dahomey. By this point, after witnessing the use of the Mino in battle, the Europeans began to call them the Dahomey Amazons, which is what we shall be calling them henceforth in this podcast. By 1731, Agaja subjugated the Mahi, finally having a clear path to Godome. By 1732, Agaja and his forces stormed the city, burning large portions of it and selling a lot of the citizens to the Europeans. Within a few months, Houphon made another play to retake the city, but without the support he had before, with the public defeat ringing in public memory, he would be repelled much more easily. The next target on his list was the Dutch presence in the region, which had been supporting a lot of his enemies. He was able to gain support against the Dutch by trying to play the British, French, and Portuguese against the Dutch. The Dutch forces would not be happy with this development, as Agaja tried to ban them from several ports that the Dahomey owned and prevented the building of forts in the region. To this end, the Dutch would try to encourage revolt within the kingdom by financing several of Agaja's enemies. In 1733, Houphon passed away, which created a vacuum of power amongst those Ouida that were still in exile, and a miniature civil war erupted between Houphon's two sons. Agaja used this as an opportunity to weaken the Ouida further by supporting the faction that was more amenable to Dahomey rule. And in 1734, with a combined Ouida, French, and Dahomey army, the other Ouida faction was crushed, and Agaja allowed the prince to resettle his people. With Ouida, and Godomi resolved, Agaja turned to more administrative matters. He made sure to retain the Ardra chieftains in order to retain power in Ardra amongst the Ardra people. He propped up the ones that were more supportive of him, but then he made an economic move that would further increase his troubles. He tried to monopolize the slave trade in the Bight of Benin, through a royal monopoly. Chapter 5 Royal Monopoly and Rebellion Prior to 1733, the slave trade in the Dahomey Kingdom was usually run by chieftains and slave merchants that operated between Ardra and Weda. Most of the slaves would come from the interior and thus would have to be shipped to Weda in order to be sold at the ports. This was what initially made Weda such a lucrative target economically. The merchants had enjoyed complete autonomy in the slave trade, paying the requisite taxes to the state. The merchants helped to supply Agaja with funds initially 
because its campaigns meant that they would have an ample supply of slaves to sell to the Europeans. Some would even finance some rebellions that the new Agaja would put down, which would give them more people to sell off. This also allowed powerful merchants and kingdoms to claim the territories of the people sold over and over again and expand their land holdings, further bolstering their own economic ability. The merchants of Jaquin would also import slaves from the Oyo Kingdom to be brought to the coastal ports. A lot of these slaves that were not sold off were then given to the Dahomey King, usually for use on the royal farms, or as rewards to serve his military units after campaigns. Initially, whenever a war campaign was done, all slaves were to be turned over to the king, who would nominally sell them to the merchants, or to sell some himself to the Europeans. The merchants would also give a manifest to the royal family detailing the number of slaves sold, the type of ship they were transported on, in order to have proper records. It is these records that we have from the French that show us this little economic background. Criminals were also sold off into slavery, rather than be held in jail cells, especially several non-high-ranking political officials or their family members. By 1733, Agaja started to try and apply pressure to the various slave merchants and their suppliers, seizing access to the slave trade routes and executing officials who tried to independently trade in slaves. It seems that the intent was for the Crown to completely own the slave trade in the region and have most of the profits. Whether this to was an intent to replenish funds from campaigns or some other reason, it cannot be fully said. What is important, however, is that this action drastically increased the ire against Agaja from both the merchant classes and the Europeans, who had enjoyed a laissez-faire free market style arrangement, but now had to be forced to deal with one specific buyer. Agaja also tried to control the import of slaves sent by both the Oyo and the Kingdom of Tado. This is what led to several merchants and European agents financing rebellions in order to force Agaja to return to a free trade system. Several rebellions would harass Agaja's grip on power up until 1737. The merchants were actually successful in raising a large enough army comprised of indigenous, Oyo, and European forces, especially Dutch forces, to march publicly against Agaja. The battle ended in favor of the merchants, and when the merchants went to the palace after handing Agaja a complete defeat, he was forced to end the royal monopoly on the slave trade. With his economic ambitions crushed, Agaja turned his attention to the kingdom of Badagri, at this time an oil-controlled kingdom that today exists just along the border between modern Nigeria and Benin. The Dahomey Badagri War ended in 1737 with a Dahomey victory. The Oyo Kingdom, however, stated that this violated the peace treaty made earlier as Agaja had campaigned too close to their borders, and thus war was resumed between the two in 1739, with the Oyo defeating Dahomey at every turn. Agaja once again had to pay tribute to Oyo towards the end of his reign, with his son Tegbesu negotiating for reduced hostilities 
between the two empires. For this, Algaja stated that Tegbesu, fifth among his sons, would be the one to inherit the throne. To say the elder sons were not pleased with this development would be an understatement. What is also of note is that in this time period, as noted by European missionaries, was the increased worship of a religion called Vodun in the kingdom, which is attributed to Agaja endorsing the religion after taking a wife that was an ardent follower of this religion. Due to the way the nature of this specific religion worked, it being a very decentralized religion and extremely inflexible, it made it very hard for Christian efforts to destroy the religion. This can be seen in how Vodou survived the voyage through the Atlantic slave trade, where it was localized into the word voodoo. After all his accomplishments, Agaja would pass away in 1740, leaving a tenuous throne to be left to Tegbesu, who now had to survive the ire of his brothers, but also the ire of everyone else his father made an enemy of. Agaja's impact on the history of the Dahomey Kingdom cannot be understated. Compared to his previous ancestors, he made the most rapid expansions and caused the biggest shifts in the region at the time. Several kingdoms that had enjoyed independence now found themselves under the banner of an empire ruled by a people they did not like, and Agaja's efforts had severely depopulated the region in Benair, with his increased activity with the transatlantic slave trade. While the slave trade did indeed go on in other parts of West Africa, such as in the Yoruba Kingdom of Oyo, the Bight of Benair, where the Dahomey held power, was called the Slave Coast for a reason, as a large exodus of slaves did indeed come from Dahomey-controlled areas. The fact that Agaja tried to play the European powers against each other shows how much Agaja overestimated the ability of his kingdom, including his efforts against the Oyo, which were a much larger power in the region and had been a superpower for much longer than his kingdom had existed. This would leave certain effects on the rest of the Dahomey history, but Agaja is still remembered well as a grand conqueror, which is why there are many statues of him today in Abomey, Ardra, Wida, and many of the other cities that the Dahomey once had control over. Whatever one's personal belief of Agaja was, the impact would still be felt today. Chapter 6 Dahomey After Agaja Tegbesu didn't start his reign in the safest of circumstances. Rather, his father had left him in an awkward position, resolving a civil war against four separate opponents, these opponents being his brothers. His brothers were quick to storm the palace and try to kill him, but Tegbesu had access to the one resource they did not, the Amazons themselves. Tegbesu's Amazons were able to rout the invaders, allowing Tegbesu to consolidate the throne for himself and within several months, he dealt with all of his brothers. Tegbesu inherited a lot of troubles from his father that were not just family related. The main issue currently was consolidating the legitimacy of his rule, especially in the areas Agaja had subjugated prior, and not wanting to raise the ire of the merchants after Agaja had tried to pull a monopoly on the slave trade in the Bight of Benair. 
Tegbesu had the hard task of winning over the merchant classes, the chieftains of the conquered states, and maintaining good relations with the Oyo Empire and the European powers. To this end, Tegbesu's rule is stated to have been focused purely on the diplomatic and administrative side of things, apart from the odd conflict here or there. He also had to be concerned about his borders to the west. The powerful Ashanti Empire, though based in modern-day Ghana, was already expanding eastward and had built up quite the seafaring fleet and had been engaging in trade talks with the Oyo, bypassing the Honi Sea borders entirely. Without having to worry about war from the Oyo region, Tegbesu was able to restore Abomi as the capital of the Dahomey Empire. He had intentions to gain more profitability for his personal coffers in the slave trade, but would not make the mistake of his father as to enact another royal monopoly. The Oyo Kingdom at this time was having a more vested interest in the slave trade and put political pressure on Tegbesu to limit his participation in the slave trade itself. Faced with the threat of annihilation at the hands of the Oyo, Tegbesu complied, but was still able to make a lot of revenue from the slave trade. With this revenue, he enacted bribes and placating payments in order to establish legitimacy in the places that his father had conquered in order to maintain the stability of the empire, and tried to maintain good relations with the Asante. By this point in history, the Amazons had established themselves, and according to a lot of European visitors, would often march in ceremony around the king. Many European envoys would start to travel to Dahomey specifically to see the Amazons for themselves and document them, though some of the reports were highly exaggerated, describing them as women with tails fierce demon women, savage women that will cut off people's heads and commit cannibalism, amongst other European exaggerations at the time. Tegbesu's rule was mostly uneventful for most of his reign until 1763. Negotiations with the Asante Empire had broken down, as Tegbesu was intent on making sure that the empire did not encroach on his borders. Tegbesu wrote to Oyo for assistance, making the case that the Oyo kingdom would not want to have another superpower arriving on its very own doorstep if the Dahomey were to fall. In 1764, the Dahomey and Oyo marched together against the Asante, Records from all three parties indicate that the battle was won in favor of the Dahomey and the Oyo, forever preventing the ambitions of the Asante from reaching as far as Benin or what would become Nigeria. After that, peace reigned in Dahomey and Tegbesu was able to further shift administrative duties to his son. Pengla, who was born in 1735, but was now a man in his 40s, with a child of his own, by the 1770s. Tegbesu would die of old age in 1774, and for Pengla, like his father before him, had to deal with another civil war over the issue of succession. Pengla was able to put down many of his opponents, but weakened his position, as many in the empire did not feel he could govern as effectively when he began his reign in 1774. Pengla would also focus on administration for most of his tenure. He wanted to also bolster the armed forces at his disposal, 
so we used the income from the slave trade to hire craftsmen to teach the locals how to craft more recently developed firearms. This attempt would not go so well so easily, as Oyo wanted even more control of the slave trade and would charge a large fee to the neighboring kingdoms that wanted the slaves that Oyo was providing. Relations were nearly sour again with Oyo. In 1781, Pengla's Prime Minister died during an Oyo diplomatic visit for their yearly tribute. Season upon the chaos caused by the loss of the Prime Minister, the Oyo Kingdom demanded women as well as money, including all of the Prime Minister's widows. Pengla gave in to their demands and handed over 100 Dahomean women. Three months later, the King of Oyo threatened an invasion if he could not have more women for his personal harem. Pengla decided to use a loophole in the demand as it was to provide women that belonged to him. The women did not have to be specifically from Dahomey themselves. This made his attention turn to the kingdom of Aguna to the west, and he planned an invasion to curb this thorn in his side and make his payment to Oyo at the same time. Initially, Pengla sent his main force of male warriors to take down the kingdom of Aguna, but they were repelled. Hearing this, Pengla armed his Amazons with the latest firearms of the day and marched on Aguna in 1781, defeating its leader and capturing 1,800 women, all of which he gave to the Oyo. With one enemy destroyed and another potential enemy satisfied, Pengla could return his focus to administration. Pengla is credited with creating a lot of public works, as well as construction in all of the territories incorporated into the empire. Pengla then tried to put economic sanctions on Oyo, raising tariffs on the slave trade to allow those in the Bight of Bene to not have to pay any higher rates towards the Oyo. This failed as the Oyo showed about the ports of Wida with a massive fleet in a display of power towards Pengla, forcing him to submit. This left Pengla and the Dahomey Kingdom with a massive economic downturn, meaning Pengla could not expand as he did not have the funds to do so. Pengla's age was starting to show, and several political factions were starting to form wanting to each have the throne of Dahomey for themselves by 1788. One of these factions was headed by Hraku, one of Agajo's grandsons. Another faction was led by a different grandson. Agonglo, Pengla's oldest son, tried to make sure that the local prime minister, or Mehu, as you might recall, and the Migan, another political position, would vouch for his right to the throne. Once Pengla passed away in 1789, there was a quick scramble for the throne. Agonglo quickly got both the Mehu and the Migan to hail him as the new ruler, but the other three factions were in uproar over this as they saw Agonglo as unfit for rule. Though Agonglo may have had the support of the Mehu and the Mihan, he did not have the support of the most necessary social faction, the Amazons themselves. The Amazons had not picked a side in the conflict and instead had just resumed their duties as normal. Agonglo then decided to appeal to the citizens in order to gain their support. The kingdom spent an entire year in a political quagmire as the various factions either fought with each other or tried to block the others 
from enacting policies for the kingdom. Despite the reduced treasury funds caused by all the infighting, Agonglo took the course of action to reduce taxes for the populace, allowing slave traders, both local and European, a lot more flexibility in their business and expanding the individual rights of his citizens. He also gave several of his opposition members places in his court and cabinet to give them power and to placate them. For several of the opposition members that he could not control, he made the move to incorporate them directly into his army and place them on the front lines of battle as a measure to eliminate them personally and permanently while praising them as heroic warriors and champions of the kingdom. It initially seemed that Agonglo's reign by 1790 would be stable, but then an epidemic of smallpox started to ravage the entire empire, reducing his armed forces and the population significantly. There was only one saving grace from this disaster. The smallpox started to carry over to the Oyo Kingdom, which had contracted it during the trade routes. This weakened the Oyo Kingdom significantly, and by 1796, the Oyo leadership passed away, leaving a power vacuum there. Agonglo tried to seize the opportunity to end the Oyo's suzerain status with Dahomey. The local factions felt this would be a short-sighted endeavor and stymied his efforts for independence. He was able to have more autonomy while power struggles went on in Oyo, but the Minga forbade him from attacking Oyo. Instead, Agonglu seized the chance to improve the economic welfare of the Dahomey by increasing the amount of slave raiding on coastal cities. These all ended in failure, especially in Porto Novo, where his fleet was sunk and the surviving soldiers captured. On land, he was able to make successful raids against the Mahi Kingdom and turn his attention to the Yoruba Kingdom of Little Popo by forging an alliance with its neighboring kingdom, Grand Popo, in order to split the spoils between themselves. Agonglo expected that this would increase the profitability with Europe, but the British Empire started focusing its efforts more on the Bight of Biafra than the Bight of Benair, and fewer English ships appeared in Dahomey ports. Trade with the French was completely halted as a result of the French Revolution and the subsequent reign of terror on the Robespierre happening in France at this time. The Portuguese, long-time traders of the Dahomey, came under attack by French ships, as France during the Robespierre reign had an anti-slavery policy at the time and was trying to exert influence on the European powers, making the port of Dahomey, especially in Mida, no longer safe to trade in, further destabilizing the Dahomey economy. Agonglo was now desperate for Portuguese trade and sent diplomatic envoys to Maria I of Portugal requesting that the slave trade be resumed. Maria I accepted under the condition that Agonglo abolish the local Vodun religion and replace it with Catholicism. Agonglo agreed to these terms in order to guarantee the trade. This did not go over well with the local factions of Dahomey, especially the rest of the royal family of Dahomey. Several of the political factions that Agonglo had managed to pacify were in uproar over this, and they gave their support for Agonglo's brother, Dogan. Some sources state that a woman named Na Winjile joined Dogan in the assassination. Whether she was a regular citizen or an Amazon is not clear, but what is confirmed is that Agonglo 
was shot while on his throne or poisoned, according to other sources. This left Agonglo's second oldest son, Adandozan, in charge, despite him being a child. This meant that several regents had to be appointed to manage the actual rule of the Dahomey Kingdom until Adandozan came of age. One of young Adandozan's first policies upon taking the throne, with the approval of the regents, was to order a mass execution of all the belligerents against his father, executing hundreds and selling some into slavery to remove all the opposition to him. Once he came of proper age in 1804, he resumed the slave raiding practices against Mahi and Porto Novo, with more success than his father had. However, the Oyo, by 1805, had settled their power struggle and internal problems, and once again reasserted their dominance over Dahomey. Like his father before him, Adandozan reached out to improve trade, this time without requiring conversion to Catholicism in the process. This time, he was not interested in the selling of slaves. Rather, he wanted to improve the infrastructure and industry of Dahomey, wanting Portuguese scientists and smiths to help him build factories in Dahomey. Negotiations with the Portuguese were tense, with the Portuguese requesting the release of several political prisoners, but talks broke down, and he tried with the British Empire instead. The British, by this time, were not on good terms with Dahomey, with Adandozan trying to claim British women for himself as their wives, which the British Empire was not terribly fond of. Things got worse for Adandozan, as the British ended the slave trade on their end in 1807. This forced the king to focus on agriculture production, as the British would harass other slaving empires with their large ships. The only slaving empire that Dahomey could still trade with were the Portuguese. One specific Portuguese trader in particular was growing in economic power enough to rival Adandozan's own political power. Francisco Félix de Souza. De Souza and Adandozan became economic rivals, which led to De Souza being imprisoned in Weida after trying to request payments from the loans he had personally given to Dahomey. De Souza was able to escape and meet up with Adandozan's younger brother Hezo, and together they would plot to overthrow Adandozan's reign. This ends part two of a look at the Dahomey Kingdom and its Amazons. Right now, the kingdom seems to be in a lot of strife after Agaja's passing, with several civil wars and claimants for the thrones, and the political landscape shifting, especially with the ending of the slave trade by the British Empire. The French Revolution, the American Revolution, and several other European upheavals were also making trade a fluctuating problem for the Dahomey Kingdom. But with this, things would only get worse for the Dahomey, and their glory days would be on the decline from now on. Thank you for listening to part two. This is Afro Storian signing out. Like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you in part three of the tale of this kingdom of Amazons. Afro Storian out.